Away we go here on our free agency round table. Not a super active day for the Browns. They did come to an agreement with Tack McKinley. Here's what we're going to do. We all have a take that we're going to throw out there, uh, and we're just going to kick those around a little bit. Doug, start us off. What's your take? Mine isn't a take. It's a tack. Ooh. I like it. I think this is the right way to go. I think going in the second tier of edge rushers is the way to go here. And I understand why the Browns did it. And I am intrigued to hear what other people think of it. But I think there's, I think we have to have a salary cap discussion at this point because I'm not getting, nobody's going to argue that Tack McKinley is better than Carl Lawson. Nobody is arguing that he's better than Trey Hendrickson or Yannick Ngakwe or anybody else. But we're talking about why they did what they did. So I like it. I thought this is what they would do. And it makes a lot of sense to me. And so my take is that, like, I think perhaps I am more pleased as we record this on Tuesday night than most people around this who think they should have gone bigger at this position. I think it fits if with exactly what they're trying to do. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Doug, you've got to take a way bigger victory lap than that, my friend. You started out saying they should go for a safety, and you got that yesterday. Then you didn't you, even have the right name on that one. Yeah, then you specifically, specifically named Tack. Now, come on, you're being a little modest, which really isn't like you. So let's take the victory lap. Come on. I'm such a smug jerk. 95% of the time I was trying <laughs> to hold back a little bit. But yeah, I'm here for a lap, baby. Boom, nailed it. Tack. Now, I paid him twice what the Browns paid him. When we did our free agency thing, I gave him $8 million a year for three years. He got $4 million for one year. So maybe Tack needs me as his agent. Listen, <laughs> it made sense. He's the guy, as Mary Kay, you pointed out in your story. They tried to claim him 38 different times over the past year. They see something here. Does anybody hate the Tack McKinley signing? I'm just, I mean, I don't hate it. I don't love it. I'm not like running laps around. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced this guy's going to, you know, light the world on fire and resurrect his career. I, I just, I, I can't be that opposed to this signing because I think what's the what's the worst case scenario with this signing? He doesn't make the 53 man roster. Okay. So you what? so you put four million dollars. You think he might not make the roster? He's like their starting defensive end, isn't he? He never even played for the Raiders. No, I know. He had a goofy year last year. There, I, there's well, a chance. The, I mean, yeah, there's absolutely a chance. Like, I don't think it's gonna happen. There's a chance it could happen. Well, the only reason you hate this signing is if you think. This is it. If you think he's the answer, he's the primary or a big part of the primary answer defensive end, and you think they should have gone harder there. So, I mean, are people sitting here thinking like, okay, he's the Claiborne replacement and the Vernon replacement still coming? I'm very curious to feel to figure out where people think this signing fits in the structure of the roster and the structure of the cap and how much they're actually relying on him. Is this guy a flyer, backup flyer, take a shot? Or is he like a, does he get a start on their defensive line and play all the time? I don't love the approach here, but there's got to be something else. You're not going to uh, put really, I don't think this job in tax hands and say he is your starting defensive end. I, I, I'm not feeling it. Why am I not feeling it? Because uh, he just really hasn't shown the kind of consistency and stability on and off the field that you're going to need from that position. I think it's an important and very key position. And he's either been injured or at odds with his team. And I, I have to wonder, I mean, John Gruden was all about him at the end of uh, last season when they acquired him and they, they had the opportunity to re-sign him. They had him in their own building and they let him go and they upgraded with Yannick Nagakoe. Now, of course, we're talking about different price points and different amounts of money and things like that. Uh, but so this doesn't seem to me like it can be the answer. The answer has got to be coming from somewhere else. You're not going to put uh, this very important job in the hands of someone that really hasn't provided consistent sack production since 2018 and of the seven sacks in 2018, three of them came in one game in week four against the Bengals. So really uh, he only had 
four sacks in his other how many ever games he played that season I think it was a pretty full season he played 15 games that year so yeah four sacks in the other 14 games um so I'm not I'm not seeing you know consistent production when he was made a full-time starter in 2019 he started 13 out of the 14 games he played in 2019 and for whatever reason and I haven't really had a time to dive into this all yet but he ended up when he had his big chance with only three and a half sacks that year PFF has a has a stat called pass rush productivity which is pressures created on a per snap basis sacks get a little more weight uh in 2019 last time McKinley played a, a full season his uh PRP was 6.5 which was 53rd among good rushers he was tied with Ngakwe and Clowney on that the year before that uh he was about seven something he was tied with Shaq Barrett um a lot of these guys that we think of as, as top uh top end edge rushers maybe have the sack numbers that he hasn't had on a consistent basis but as far as pressures per snap um, he's pretty close with a lot of these guys. He's not up there with Miles Garrett and Nick Bosa and, and JJ Watt, but he's, he's in this tier of guys who, who, like I said, uh, guys who are, are seen as kind of prizes this off season have been consistently down there with him. I think he was tied with Clowney in like 2017 as well. Um, the thing with McKinley that maybe makes me wonder how he fits into this defense is the fact that he's a lot like BJ Goodson in that, if they do make him the guy, if he gets Olivier Vernon type snaps, he's going to be getting more snaps. He's going to be more three down edge rusher than he's ever been. He, he's topped out at like 57, 56% of snaps in his career. And Vernon and Garrett are, you know, both, they're both over 70% here. So that's a lot like Goodson who came here and suddenly he's got more snaps than he's ever had. He's in coverage more than he's ever been. And he kind of had to get used to some situations he wasn't used to. So, that's probably in McKinley's future. We don't know if he can handle it. Um, I do think they'll probably address this in the draft, but I think Doug's right. McKinley's probably the guy. Um, Porter Gustin probably get every opportunity to see if he can make a jump, but McKinley is your, is your, is your starter at the other edge. And I think there's more to pass rush than just putting a guy on that edge and saying, all right, go get the job done. A lot of it has to do with, with the people behind him. And that's why John Johnson got such a big deal.